are evenly divided, um, and I heard that it's mostly women, but some men, and I'm very glad to see the men here, starting with Steve, but all the rest of you too, because uh, we'll hear more about why, why that's important for everybody. So let me turn it over now to Faye to get the discussion started. Faye, thank you very much. Thanks, Susan, uh, and thank you, Ian, for inviting me to moderate uh, this uh, panel discussion this afternoon. And, of course, this uh, panel discussion comes on the heels of the Foreign Service Journal issue that was devoted to work life. And, in fact, just before coming here, I ran into a, a retired Foreign Service uh, uh, friend. She's actually a Foreign Service husband, also worked for the department. And she said, oh, that was just the best Foreign Service Journal ever. And uh, she thought it highlighted some really critical issues. But thank you, all of you, for coming today. And I know we have a... We have some resource people in the audience as well. I know Leslie Tejera from Flo is here who will be able to answer some questions. And we have Gabrielle Hampson and Diana Rooney from Flo. And uh, I'm Ed Diggins from Africa. Okay. The the term work life uh, hasn't been around for forever, but it's been around for 25 years. The term was coined in 1986. Why in 1986? Maybe that was the time we all started using computers and the whole office scene took on a different, uh, different expectations. Of course, we at State were using the Wang, so I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> our expectations. Um, but our panelists today uh, bring different perspectives. And one of the things we thought we'd start with was what we all have an idea of what work life means to us personally. But what is the definition of work life? And to kick that off, Kathy would like to talk about, she of course is the director for Alliance for Work-Life Progress, and she would like to talk about the definition of work-life balance. Kathy. Thank you, Faye. Um, I thought it would be a good place to start there because work-life is a term I actually detest and thought when I came to head up the Alliance for Work-Life Progress, I could kill it forever. <laughs> such luck. You've heard about stickiness in the Malcolm Gladwell sense. Well, it's so sticky, I just can't, I can't make it go away. But all it is is an intersection. The problem with work life, it, it implies an intersection. And it tells you nothing about content. And it also begs for a qualifier. So all kinds of strange things trail behind it, from balance to integration to navigation, um, conflict, etc. So I thought we'd start. It is a body of knowledge. It's a technical body of knowledge. There are professionals who practice it. So I thought I'd tell you what the intersection is and something about the work-life portfolio. What work-life is the intersection of is the four balls that anyone who works juggles in the air at any given time. Everyone who works is a juggler. And they're juggling at least four things fairly simultaneously at any given five minutes within a work or a personal day. Those four things are career or other people depending on uh, who you are and what your job is. That can be a job, it can be a profession, it can be called work. But the place that you gain um, your employment from, career. The next ball is family. And love them or leave them, we all got them. Um, even people who claim they haven't got family. And the definition of family, as a matter of fact, in those 25 years that Faye has been talking about has changed enormously. So family, however defined, and that's also individual, but maybe uh, professional as well, depending on who is covered in benefits, etc. It's a technical definition of family. But a family is a, you're anybody who you feel connected to spouse, a partner, a significant other of any kind, parents, relatives, children, and pets. There are many people to whom family is a pet. So that is tremendously important. The third ball <coughs> that people juggle and that they're connected to is community. Now community too has different definitions. It can be the community you live in, say that's Washington DC or your neighborhood in Washington DC, but it can also be global particularly for people as um, in your work environment who are stationed in different places, that becomes your community, however temporary. And in your case, um, it seems to me you're juggling community in about five different ways that the average business worker doesn't have to cope with. And then the fourth ball, and the one usually left to crash on the ground most often, is self. 
And self has everything to do with your health, with your resilience, with your development, with who you are in the middle of all these other things. And I'm sure in your work environment, like the average American business environment, that is the last and the least to be taken care of. So while these four balls are kind of moving around in the air, employers have come to realize that this is really important stuff. So there's a very important concept here, given these four balls and this intersection, which are these interconnected dependencies. If you don't know this now, you certainly um, have to recognize you do not ever hire an individual. You do not hire one person when you bring someone into your workforce. You inherit a system of interdependencies, resources, and tools. You get things, you get benefits, and you get resources and tools when you bring someone on staff, but you also get families, you get a community, you get this evolving concept of self, and you get an expanding career that needs to go somewhere. This makes work life one of the more dynamic, um, difficult, but exciting uh, domains within, I guess I'd call it human resources, although it expands even beyond human resources. Now, what this means is that there are a cadre of work-life professionals, and one of the tools that we apply that your average benefits and some other HR people don't is systems analysis, a systems approach. So, I'm going to refer to you right now the handout that you had on your seat when you arrived. Organizationally, then, what does this look like? I've told you about the intersections. Organizationally, support for these this intersection, this universal juggling act, over the last 20 years has clustered into seven categories of work-life support, if you will. And there are proof points in here because um, another important concept that I want you to walk away with is employers have learned, and employers of all kinds, not just in uh, for-profit business, they've learned that ensuring that people feel effective at work and at home and meeting these multiple responsibilities provides measurable, and I mean measurable, benefit for all stakeholders that are implied in that intersection. The organization itself, the individual, the community, families, and therefore accomplishment of the mission. And that's not incidental, it's not something that happens when Jupiter is aligned with Mars. That's a basic fact of organizational existence. So I'm going to Stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy. And of course, um, the uh, foreign service context of work life is really a, a complicated overlay of the things you talked about, Kathy. And one of the big things, of course, is community, particularly when you're overseas, because you all work and play and uh, interact together more than you normally would if you were back here in the United States. And sometimes it's a little difficult to, to get a balance there. Um, I think a good segue would be to have Margo talk about some of the things she has learned in this year of doing research uh, on work-life issues, particularly as it pertains to the foreign service. Well, I think, uh, like many of you, I've also been looking for that balance. And I have to say, after 17 years in the Foreign Service, it is still elusive. It cannot be found, I don't think. Um, but I actually came to this issue um, in a number of ways. Obviously, you know, my own pursuit of trying to make things work a little bit better uh, at the intersection of those four, four spheres. But I also came to it because in Japan, um, I was one of the first women in a position uh, of some authority in charge of one of our consulates, but the first to have had children, and only the third woman in that position. So a lot of people in my district wanted me to talk about women's issues, and what they were interested in finding out is how women in the American workforce had been so successful. And what was it about the U.S. system that made women able to participate so fully? Because in the Japanese context, they do not work in the same way. Most people, most women give up their work when they have children. So I started really looking at this whole issue and found that it was a very dynamic and growing field, as Kathy's explained. Um, you had, first of all, the Obama administration in, in March of 2010 started a forum on workplace flexibility, which told you that it was really a 